Before we start, um, as we all know that the Unplugged Talks is about the person who's joined us as a speaker. We are not here to discuss professional works as much as talk about their personal journeys. Mm -hmm. We are here to discuss what makes them tick, what makes them do the things that they do, and what are the influences in their lives? What has been, um, you know, the crossroads that they have faced and the paths that they've chosen? And that's what we are hoping to discuss with Ramu today. Um, just to quickly introduce him, he was trained as an architect in Delhi and in Cambridge. He was elected a member of Reba, which is the Royal Institute of British Architects in 1974, and then the Indian Institute of Architects in 1977 and since then has been practicing architecture in India. He was initially based in Delhi, but moved to Bangalore in 97. His oeuvre includes hotels, libraries, schools, and religious buildings that have been built in all parts of the country, from um, a housing project in Butch, which is in the western deserts of the country, to a hotel in Koima, in the eastern end. Um, in the north, the practice has designed a golf club in Srinagar, and in the deep south, a house that was built in Kotayam in Kerala. His practice involved the restoration of historic buildings and working with sustainable technologies. Ramu is also credited for the creation of a sculpture gallery in the heart of Delhi in Kirki village, which I'm sure some of you would have would know of or have been to. Um, he is a part of the founding uh, team that started the TVB School of Habitat Studies, where he taught for four years. Um, it's interesting because uh, Virain also taught at the TVB and I studied at the TVB for a year before I moved. So lots of connections happening over here. Uh, Ramu was also instrumental in helping design and uh, helping designing and setting up the Dilli Heart, uh, which is a famous bazaar that allows craftspeople to sell their products directly to the customer. Um, in Delhi, it's become um, a, a very famous landmark here. His work has been published widely across platforms and he has also written two books on traditional Indian architecture. One is called Glimpses of Architecture in Kerala, published by Rupa. And the second one is The Cosmic Dance in Stone, published by Niyogi Books. So today we will be talking to Ramu about all sorts of interesting things. But before we get into the chat, Ramu, please tell us where you are and why we should envy you so much for being where you are, you are right now. Well. As I said that, you know, I had gone down to Goa many years ago, left Delhi, and now a lot of other people are leaving. But yes. I did build a small little house for myself, which I think I have sent you a little slide. Maybe you can see. I am going to share that with everyone I right now. Uh, yeah, there we are. Uh, it's, this is taken this summer uh, during the lockdown. And uh, it was a very hot day, but you can see the... Uh, flowers are, are uh, in full bloom, all the summer flowers, and a few mangoes in the, on the mango tree. So you can see this is where I'm talking to you from. And uh, I thought I should uh, sort of, you can envisage that it's not just a screen that we are talking to, <laughs> but <laughs> an actual building that one is living in and, and living in a small garden area. I mean, it's a large garden, but a small house. This so is absolutely beautiful. I and I think, uh, you know, that sh will show some of the listeners where exactly I'm talking from. Where you're talking from also gives them a little bit of a context of, um, you know, I think not just physically, but where you come from. Um, yeah. So I think that, that's quite interesting. And uh, what I would like to start our chat with today is the fact that not just the one sort of destination that you're speaking from, but to reach there, you have traveled widely and you've been traveling since you were a child. Um, yeah. You've had a very colorful journey and um, I think very exciting. So would you like to start by telling us a little bit about how your travels began as a child? Well, as you know, it was uh, right from the very beginning, I was hardly a year or two old when we actually moved around in a railway carriage because my father was in the railway police. Mm. And uh, he had a little carriage attached to the to the uh, train. So we traveled around South India. Uh, but I don't remember that. I have a few pictures. But that's how my travels began. And uh, it was a, it's been a very long journey. And maybe finally I've reached a point where I might stop traveling, but I might not. <laughs> but that's how it started. And then it went on to other parts of the world because my father was in the foreign, foreign service for a while. 
So we went to China and from China we went to Egypt. So we went to these ancient, ancient uh, civilizations and perhaps one of the reasons what one got interested in architecture was because we saw these rather lovely buildings, you know, in those, in those days. Mm-hmm. So that's how it all started in the travels. And then, of course, I've been traveling a great deal since then. So it's interesting. You said that you, you know, you went from in between the couple of things that you mentioned, you've also lived in very different kinds of or typologies of houses and housing. Yeah. Um, yeah. you know, I've, I've read on your website, whether it was, like you said, in literally on a train to uh, staying in a courtyard sort of a housing uh, environment in China. Um, you had a houseboat when you were in Cairo, which I believe that your, mom, uh, your mother rented out. Um, yes. So you, you've kind of experienced varying um, environments that you've lived in. So it's not just visiting. And I think yeah. that's where I want to draw the distinction is that it's one thing to visit places, but it's a completely different experience to actually live there and experience life there. And I'm sure all these have sort of influenced you in some way, haven't they? Well, absolutely. And in fact, that's the reason I'm, it's very uh, strange that we should be talking because I've been writing about this a great deal and trying to put some books, uh, you know, pictures together in relation Mm -hmm. to what you said. And it, it's interesting that once you put imagery to it, for instance, uh, uh, my father, who was rather a senior officer in the South, when he came to Delhi after independence, we had to live in tents. And these tents were put up actually where the, now the Supreme Court uh, is built, the, new, uh, the old Supreme Court. And there was a sort of colony of tents, maybe 20 to 30 tents, where senior officers lived in with their families mm-hmm. before they could be, you know, since there was no accommodation in those days after independence. So that was a f- very interesting uh, kind of uh, a house which I've talked about in my book. And then we moved to barracks, and you know, we were moved to various stages of government housing, and finally ended up in a Lachin's bungalow. With the- end of his career. Oh, wow. So the, I, the, I, the idea of living in a Lachin's bungalow is, of course, many people like to do that. And as you know, it's even today, a minister is very keen to find out which house he's going to live in. <laughs> and uh, so to be able to live in the heart of Delhi with two acres around you and lots of roses and things, that Delhi at its absolutely perfect uh, peak, but mm. Delhi changes, and very few people have that opportunity, you know, to live in such wonderful places. So then you move on to other places. I traveled and went to abroad to study, and I stayed at Cambridge, which is a very beautiful spot, and studied there and met a lot of very senior English architects who went on to become uh, very well known architects. They were young teachers themselves, so it was to see them, you know, provide uh, great buildings. One of them was uh, Sabari Gasson, he was my tutor. Right. He was knighted because he uh, designed the Glasgow Museum, which is, a, uh, you know, the Burrell Museum, which is yeah. a very well-known uh, museum in North of England or Scotland. Yeah. And it was a really great building because it uh, uh, was a competition design and he won the competition. And it was in a park that was, uh, so he didn't want to encroach on the park. So he built a whole, uh, one facade of the the, uh, building he made in glass, Hmm. which overlooked forests around the, and so it's a very iconic building. Not too many people know about it, but as an English building, it's certainly, in my view, one of the most unique ones. And it brings in the light from various places. And the Barrel Collection is, of course, a very well-known collection because there was this strange man who, who was a very rich and wealthy trader who collected objects, a bit like Salah Jang did in Hyderabad. Mm. Salah Jang bought anything. You know, whatever was brought in front of him, he bought. So Salajang Museum in Hyderabad has all his artifacts and the Baral collection has the, uh, the Baral, you know, Baral uh, lovely art, uh, art of, it's a huge collection. I mean, it's massive. They are not able to 
house the full collection. So that's a very interesting building and that she was my immediate teacher and hmm. really kept up with him. And you met a lot of other interesting people as well in Cambridge. And um, I mean, we'll definitely come back to one of the masters that you had the opportunity to interact with. But tell us uh, about some of the other people that you met and who you think have had an influence in the Of course, they, they, they were all have done great things in England. Uh, there, is, uh, there is, of course, uh, Sir Colin Wilson, hmm. who was the, uh, the designer of the British Library. And he did that soon after designing one of the uh, great cathedrals in the Liverpool Cathedral he designed. Uh, was he teaching you at Cambridge? He was teaching. He was our third year master. Okay. And uh, he then became the director of the school later after the, the professor who was Leslie Martin, who has mm. designed the festival hall in South London. You know, these were the very well-known buildings now, they are very iconic buildings, but he was the director of the school. And he, he and then Leslie, uh, not Leslie, Colin Wilson, Sandy as we used to know, call him, he, he uh, designed the British Library, uh, which took many, many years to design. And it's now one of the places where I did my research for cosmic dance, uh, this, uh, this uh, cosmic dance in stone. It's very interesting and very modernistic building. Uh, so these were the sort of uh, people that one came across. I mean, people like Foster and uh, and what's the other guy, the uh, uh, Pompidou sent him. Piano? Uh, uh, not piano. Sorry, Richard, Richard Rogers. Rogers. Richard, Richard Rogers. Rogers. Yeah. But they were all young uh, at that time. They must have been in their 30s and 40s. Now they're in the so they used to all come up. Ted Callanan was a very famous, uh, uh, who became very famous and became uh, um, the uh, gold medalist in the Royal Academy, uh, Royal Institute of British Architects. He was very influential. He was our second year master. And he was very influential at that time to provide a certain degree of anarchy among the students because he himself was an anarchist mm. uh, and he built all these rather green buildings in those days, you know, and uh, he's very well known for his, uh, you know, um, what he built, uh, the eco-friendly eco buildings. I'm talking about the 70s and 80s. Right. So he was a bit of an anarchist and, and at that time there was the same year, the second year, uh, there was the great Paris revolution, mm. student revolution, and where all the students, um, you know, uh, came out on the streets and the whole of France came to a standstill due to the students rioting and stopping everything working. That grew into the rest of the uh, Europe, into Holland and into Belgium and other places. I don't know how far it went, but there was a certain degree of anarchy they were projecting which came into uh, the School of Architecture where I studied. And certainly some of my batchmates uh, became, um, you know, very concerned about the, the revolution. So what was your personal response to it? I didn't do too much. I went off to Amsterdam and there were all these white cycles. Now they have all, you know, but you could just get onto a cycle painted white and uh, leave it anywhere. That was the form of anarchy in those days. But we went to meet an architect called Hermann Hertzberger who's another of the early, you know, revolutionaries in architecture and he changed the way of housing in Holland in those days. He believed that we can't build high as skyscrapers and he built in streets, you know, the housing he made in mm. street. And he invited us to his. So it was, you know, a semi-anarchical version of our, uh, you know, the few friends we had, but the man I went with, he became a total anarchist. He's now in, in, in Africa, but uh, he actually occupied a house, he and a few friends from our college. They occupied a house in London, which was unoccupied and formed a little community there. So they just uh, did that, you know, that kind of level to which they took that. <laughs> so that's part of uh, what happened to some of my batchmates. Some became very successful, of course and became very uh, well-known architects later. Of course, and we, we definitely count you amongst those. Um, we also know that you had an interesting uh, 
interaction with Louis Kahn as part of your, uh, while, you, while he was there for a talk at Cambridge? Yes, actually it was lucky that he came because um, he was on his way back from India, in fact. And okay. one of his friends was teaching in, uh, in uh, the school where I was studying, and we were like in second year or something. And he decided that, uh, you know, he invited him and said, why don't you join the students? So, you know, Khan, as you well know, he likes to talk to people surrounding him. Uh, he doesn't like to, as he likes them to participate in the discussion. And he did keep aside a whole morning for us. And he spoke about the IIM building that was half built in those days. And he showed us some slides. And uh, he was showing how he envisaged the IIM, which was tremendous for me because I was an Indian, uh, perhaps the only Indian in the class. And he uh, spoke about the wonderful spirituality he had learned in India and how he was able to understand the way to build that building. And, mm -hmm. and many of you who have been to the IIM will realize how beautiful space it is once you enter. And he spoke about that at length. And he spoke about the way he used the brick uh, uh, because he said that was the basic material in India. He said I was able to use it to create these spaces. So it was a tremendously uh, valuable talk. In fact, it changed my own way of looking at buildings because he always, he talked about a presence in buildings. He talked about creating just, just not space and light, but he said, once you walk into a building, it must feel right. Mm. I think this is, the, uh, this is something that I have tried to, even in my own work, uh, make sure that it worked as, a, as, as the primary issue in a building. It didn't matter whether it was big, small, but it must feel right as you enter the building. And I think some of them I did succeed <laughs> in so doing this. It's actually interesting because, you know, more, I would say most architects today talk about a certain quality in a space, um, whether it's, it's an open space or whether it's a building, but everyone talks about a quality. Um, a lot yeah. of times we are unable to necessarily put terms or put values to that quality, but there's there's always this some abstraction that we are searching for or we're hoping to ascribe to a space. Um, yeah. And like you said, Khan calls it presence. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Christopher Alexander, I think very conveniently just called it the quality without a name uh, because he yeah. couldn't find the, the right term for it. Yes. Um, we've had Mr. Gantu, who was part of our Unplugged Talks um, a couple of months ago, and yeah. he talked about it as the spirit, as the spirit of a space. So as an architect, what do you think or how would you, what are the values or what are the terms that you would ascribe to a space that well, you know, like you're referring to right now? I think it's very difficult to define exactly how, uh, um, how we can achieve the space. I think uh, he, he did it purely out of instinct or whatever way he used, but he did achieve very special, uh, and you know that in his Kimball Museum also, mm. Where you, if you enter, it's got a tremendous feeling of, of light and quality of walking through it. But if you want me to say that, because I felt that it's possible to achieve the divine, that's a bit grand, but you know, when you walk into, let's say, the, uh, the um, Elephanta Caves, and I can see my, one of my friends, photographer sitting there quietly listening, Joginda. Who shot this? Uh, who shot this um, be beautiful cave? And he was able to capture the light. And we were trying to explain the sense of being in that cave, hmm. which was done maybe a thousand years ago. And they achieved the divine within a, a building, uh, Indian architects. And I think today this is something that I would certainly like to do in the form, but. We can't say that we want to achieve divinity, but we certainly want to achieve a certain sense of peace within the building. And I think that's what they had done in those days. So do you think that, um, and I, I have your book, I've, I've referred to the Cosmic Dance in Stone. It's yeah. absolutely beautiful. And Joginder, I have to congratulate you um, on the photographs. They're stunning. Who's that? Who, as I said, Joginder is watching just now. Yes. <laughs> to come on the screen for a minute. <laughs> can can we please? Would you like to add something here, Jaginder, about the book and about the work? There he is, actually. You'll just have to unmute yourself. 
Hi. No, no. Go ahead. Uh, this is a very interesting conversation. Probably I've never had this with Ramu, so I'm really look, <laughs> wanting to listen. <laughs> but that's Jogendra who took the pictures for the Cosmic Dance in Stone, which is which made it very exciting. That book. So uh, I wanted to ask you. So when you and were he's in looking... Toronto, by the way, just oh to... okay. <laughs> he's talking to us from Toronto. We're all in different parts of the world, and yeah, I think that's what fascinating about your talk. It makes it quite special because we're all, you know, from different places, uh, different kinds of people. We actually have a lot of non-architects who who come and uh, participate yeah. in the talk, so it, it, it's interesting to get people's views and opinions. Um, but coming back to the book, I think what was really fascinating, and I was flipping through it yesterday again, um, is this whole aspect of light in space. Also, because it is such an um, you know, you, you talk about it as a historical, uh, more than just monuments, because these are not monuments. And you're referring to the Ajanta Lora, you're referring to Elephanta, you've even gone to um, Angkor Wat, and you're talking about temples there. Um, but what is that one quality? What is it that actually drew you to, to just create a book about temples and stone temples? Well, I I thought I, one should sort of try and explain to uh, the architects and designers' point of view when they produce such a building, what happens, let's say, in Angkor, you get a little bit caught up in the, in the uh, wonderful uh, carvings and all the light that falls on it, and photographers, of course, have captured it in magnificent ways. But very few people have actually spoken about these buildings with the kind of uh, idea of it being a space that people walk through hmm. and the light that comes in and uh, certain uh, times of the uh, day uh, what we were trying to do is to is to understand that uh, you know when you go through these beautiful buildings it's not just their mo the monumentality but the fact that you can wander through it especially in the Bayon temple where you feel completely engrossed in a building and these were the factors I wanted to understand and that's why it's called the cosmic dance because it's to actually these people were able to touch us in such a way that we felt we were part of the universe part of the cosmos beyond temple certainly uh, has that feeling that you enter there and you feel you're completely you know surrounded by stone and beauty that you get lost you know in the space and this is the sort of feeling I wanted to communicate to other architects and say, or to anyone else, that these buildings are not just monumental. They are there to achieve the divine, to achieve a sense of uh, discovery about yourselves. And this is what these designers of that, day, that time were able to achieve. And to a large extent, we as modernists are not able to do easily. We have done it, one or two, Khan has done it. And, mm. uh, and some of the Japanese architects have done it. Uh, so uh, they understand this idea of, of being able to express space. Uh, but uh, I think one of the problems we face in modern architecture is that we are not concerned about discovery and the individual. We are discover, uh, more concerned about, you know, maybe solving problems and, and making rather grand buildings. You know, that's my view of the international style, uh, very much in the way that Corbusier started us off, you know. He was very much trying to push forward a, a, a very strong form. And uh, it has taken Indian architects a long time to get away from that. And now you're beginning to see some of the younger architects breaking away and coming more to them, you know, what they believe in. You know? And I think this is a tremendous thing. So um, there's so many things that I want to talk to you about. One thing, uh, you know, considering that we're talking about Indian architects and breaking away from what the world or what others are doing. Um, I was reading an interview that uh, Kanvinde, uh, Achyut Kanvinde had with Narendra Dengle. Okay. And this was many, many years ago. And he talks about, he refers to the idea that, you know, he studied uh, in the West and he came back. And when he came back for the first, let's say about 10 odd years, his work was very influenced by what he had learned. And when uh, Narendra Dengle asked him about his, the transformation of his work, so he made a statement saying that, you know, when we come back from the West, we carry, so what we are doing at that point is a carry through of what we have learned. And it takes at least six to 10 years to be able to 
find freedom from it to be able to kind of drop that and realize what is it that we want to do and how we want to do it. So at one level, I'd like to ask you, did you feel that having come back from Cambridge? Because you did, you chose to, you know, you worked in the UK uh, at that point, and then you came back and you chose to set up your practice here. But did you at any point feel that you were carrying um, what you learned in the UK into oh, yes. your I, practice? Very much so. The influence is so strong when you're un working under such big names and people who have uh, tremendous conviction. I mean, these are not small names, like you said, uh, Richard Rogers and Foster. Right. People, people who have, uh, you know, have a huge influence on it. There's no doubt about it. And as Kanwinde rightly says, it takes a few years to reestablish our own identity. Hmm. But we are always looking for our identity. We can only, dis some of us have discovered it after going hmm. to the West uh, and then coming back and then saying that what is it that really makes us want to build, you know, and what is it, I think you're right, Kanwande was the first to realize that we must create some form of, of identity in the Indian subcontinent, whether it's whether how you achieve it, we were not, even now I'm not able to achieve, but I know one thing for sure that I always wanted to know what was it that any person, let's say, who built a house, one of my first houses, uh, was to see whether we could build a house, which was, what did it mean as, as a modern house, whether it should have traditional elements in it, traditional motives, or what, that sort mm. of thing. So it, it uh, made you wonder what exactly we were trying to achieve in the post-independence era and where we were going. I think this is something that has dominated many architects, especially me who came back and as you say, it took a few years to readjust to this kind of did, aspiration. Did you think that you were conscious of that? Was that for you a conscious transformation? It always it was in the back of my mind that, you know, because we, when you return to India, you always want to feel that you belong here. We are after all Indians and we wanted to feel that there was some way we must understand not the Western and Hellenistic. It's always been my view that, uh, you know, while we all, always understand the, the Western view, uh, you've gone off. <laughs> oh, I see. Uh, I hear you're back. Uh, so what I was trying to say was that the Western view is always the Hellenistic mm. view, the Greek approach to logic and it has been, a, and, and we had to learn that. Whereas when you come back here, we suddenly realize that we have a much different way of learning. And after all, our best works have been done without any Greek mm. influence. Whereas all the other works, whether it's the British colonial works, whether it's anything else, is related to a Western view. And I think post-independence, we're now beginning to find our feet. I think it's taken a generation and even Kanwin, you know, in those days, he was very formalistic. Yeah. My generation has perhaps changed a little bit. And it's the next generation who will maybe discover a really, uh, a really beautiful ideology. I, I don't know. I'm, I'm just guessing. But I think many of the young architects must feel very strongly about, or, about wanting to establish a, a language, a language that would... Uh, be more Indian, not necessarily Indian, maybe even international now because we all become global, but uh, certainly something that is meaningful. Hmm. I mean, you know, when Are we first came back... Right? Are you optimistic Sorry? of the future generation? I am very optimistic, yeah, <laughs> because, you know... That's very good to hear because no, I, I don't feel that a lot of people from earlier generations are very optimistic today. Are they... <laughs> Well, let me just put it this way. You know, you remember there was in Delhi, there was this famous uh, German architect called Heinz. And he built these Heinz, uh, you know, villas, which uh, Veren must know about. And, uh, you know, vast number. And everybody then started copying these villas. And these villas kept, and even today in Delhi, there's some Heinz influence. Yes. Yes. Am I right? In fact, uh, you may recollect Ashish's, Ashish's, uh, Ashish's office in Defence Colony, yeah. uh, as well as house. In I remember facing the club was a Heinz building. Was a Heinz building. And, yeah. uh, 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. But very so well that is, I mean, the yeah. special organization of that house was remarkably um, well, well conceived. Or maybe Ashish's talent to, to uh, habit habit inhabit such a space <laughs> adapt to it perhaps yeah yeah well, he had a beautiful quote yeah great influence on delhi architecture and you know it the the sort of remnants are still there in the great uh, in the great uh, farmhouses of of uh, chatarpur and other places you'll <laughs> see a bit of hain somewhere creeping in and as as uh, gautam bhatia famously said you know punjabi barok so uh, you know it is that part which has been caught through now i think that's why i'm optimistic and some of my younger students were much more uh, willing to try out you know a new way of of design they were they were not really caught up in this light sense of suppression that mm. uh, is has been a problem for a lot of indians historically also because after all we were uh, ruled for nearly 3 400 years by the british and moguls before we have come to this period and it's taken us 60 or 70 years to begin to really feel confident of our uh, of our way of thinking uh, there may be other aspects i won't go into politics today but <laughs> which you might uh, might question but uh, but certainly uh, the the talent available whether it's musicians artists painters uh, and dancers is absolutely brilliant you see youngsters who are uh, are you know creating their own language i know a dancer who has produced her own choreography from a traditional bharatanatyam style so this if it is reflected in 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 architectural design it would make a great difference i think but this is this is something that i just feel about i think that's yeah. very encouraging and um, i hope we've got a lot of young people who are listening in today um, yeah. but at the same time i think what also happens is very often we are kind of stuck in this dichotomy of referencing the past and looking at history and wanting to project a future and mm-hmm. as somebody and you know i i would kind of i would fondly term you an explorer you've been exploring okay. since you were a child um and um you your through your travels through your studies through your research and uh, it it would be interesting because you are you are also referencing a lot of history in the both the books that you've written and yeah. in a lot of the research that you're doing so at what point do we are or are we able to or are we able to at all sort of you know take that from the past and put it into the future because there are a lot of people who will just question that saying that what's happened why are we dwelling on bygones why don't we look at developing what is yet to come um yeah. but at at what how do we deal with that sort of uh, threshold i th- i think uh, i've been asked this question often because i speak a lot about the past mm-hmm. and the great uh, buildings that have been built both here in india and in other parts of the world and you wonder why we are not inspired by them and why the modern movement has dominated us so much there is a point i think even when uh, when um, bill colin wilson who i talked about had to defend uh, you know the uh, venturi's um, venturi's uh, extension of the national gallery in london which the prince charles said was a very ugly building uh, you know if you remember that incident and he had to defend it saying that how can you uh consider uh, you know if you don't have change in architecture how can we move forward that's mm-hmm. what the modern english architects were very upset with the prince but the prince said oh the and the national gallery when you look at it is not a particularly good looking building you know it's just a very very traditional kind of building it's not even a greek building it's just a sort of copy and a rather poor one whereas when you see venturi's building next to it it is a really interesting modern and uh, beautifully made building so to answer your question of saying that uh, we should not uh, we we should not dwell too much on the past it is absolutely right but if you are not aware of mm. what the uh, the historians and the in the beauty the history historical uh, books uh, historical buildings then we find ourselves missing something and i think even khan would say you know khan was is was in by the forts and castles of scotland he often talked about it. 
He said, uh, you know, don't build until you've seen the castles of Scotland. And as you, as you know, many of his buildings had those beautiful curves and, and, and raw form that, he, that the castle inspired him. So there is a link between the modern and the past. How we actually put it together is up to the architect. But I, I find it very difficult to accept the Bauhaus version of, of modernism mm. and the internationalism that they provided. And, uh, you know, and then which went on to become, if it becomes the New York system where, where it's uh, skyscrapers and, and uh, uh, you know, to the limit, that's fine. But when the Bauhaus was uh, corrupted in many ways and you see a modern building, let's say in Cairo, which looks like nothing on earth, you know, because it's meant to be an international building. That's what I'm objecting to. And I think a lot of Indians are doing it also. Our buildings are not particularly attractive. And uh, then you often ask young students, okay, if you want to tell me one beautiful modern building in India, which one would it be? And there is very few answers to that. So does that answer your question? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I'm not sure if there really is, is a direct answer to this. And I think what's also interesting is that, um, you know, this opens up a whole other debate about the whole idea of identity. And that's yeah. something that we've been struggling with. Um, whether we look at it as a generation or we look at it in terms of uh, regions, uh, you know. And so, and I mean, I, I kind of stay away from that debate because that's, that's a whole other conversation. But I did want to ask you, you've been writing um, your books that have, that have been so absolutely so gorgeously put together, but also they have a very um, distinct intent to them. And I wanted to ask you what that intent is because the content of the books is historical, but mm -hmm. you're obviously leaving. Is it, is it a tribute to history? Are you leaving a legacy? Are you trying to, at some point, explain a concept to um, the coming generation or the current generation? How do, how do these books and how does your work through your research fit into that equation? Well, I think what happens here is that you try to, um, use some of these old older buildings and uh, to show as an example of how they treated design, light and proportion so beautifully. And it was just a reminder really to modern architects to understand uh, how to proceed in the next uh, stage. And it's interesting that uh, to digress a little bit because Shantani Ketan was, uh, was um, inaugurated, you know, founded on the same year as, as Bauhaus. Mm. And, and, and Tagore always believed in, in a kind of, he was also very fond of architecture, as you know. He built several houses. Yeah. And every house he was trying to experiment with, uh, with the spatial qualities of the house. So I, I just wanted to say that what he was trying to do was to bring about a kind of, uh, you know, I, uh, sort of design ideology that he created and he wanted it to be slightly more um, related to the nature of, of India. And that's what I think I've been trying to do in my books is to say that we have such beautiful proportions, such beautiful design capability. And why are we not using this more? And I think that was my intent. Yeah, that's to answer your question. And I think at this moment, maybe Siddhant can show uh, one of my, the, you know, the picture of my house, the orange house. Um, you know, it's the fourth slide, I think. Uh, next, next. This yeah, this one. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a photograph showing the, uh, the house, how the light is coming in into the house. And yet it's a very strong uh, geometric um, sort of uh, uh, version of a modern building. It uh, looks at light and proportion differently. So this is what I was trying to achieve. And it, when I wrote about some of these older buildings, that it was not altogether that we can't use it in a modern building. A modern building also has a sense of light and you can see right through this building, which is what even when you go to Elephant Tower, one of these great places, 
you are always aware of the spatial quality when you enter the house. And if mm. you see the next slide, uh, again a picture by Joginder who is here, so it's nice that he's joining this thing. <laughs> he captured the light coming into the inside. And you can see that, uh, you know, the, it's, it's not a formal space. And when we talked about uh, formal to informal, here is a case of the formal becoming the informal and the light, evening light coming in to the, uh, into the building and lighting up the house. So that is what I was trying to do when I wrote these books, uh, to bring about some awareness of, of design. So this might actually be a good time to talk about, uh, you already mentioned the title of this talk, which we decided would be from the formal to the informal. Uh, would you like to tell us why you chose this? Why we chose? Well, uh, <laughs> in a sense that you said it in the earlier that, you know, we were all, uh, we were all um, trained in a very formal manner. And as I was telling you, uh, in a way, they, they, they have never been able to leave the Greek influence. Even mm. modern architects of the West have never been able to uh, leave the uh, the sense of the Greek and Roman influences. In, uh, and you know, all the buildings that come up, whether it's the uh, any of the great sort of uh, well-known buildings, always have some form of Greek influence. So it, that was the formal. Even Italian piazzas and you know Palladio and all these great names, they had a tremendous sense of formality. And and as you mentioned, it takes a long time to sort of put that aside and come back to our roots in some way and find uh, what we can do with our uh, capable you know buildings and see whether we can actually look at buildings in a more uh, a softer way even with fairly strong um, guidelines. I mean, like this building, it's such a formal building. Hmm. Yet I think it's a very soft and informal building. And that's why it, uh, it uh, tries to explain uh, what, uh, what the transition between the formal and informal. And in many ways, what you said about Garmin there, you know, you, uh, lose, losing that skin of formality and coming and learning how to live here, work here, and design in our, in the present environment. I would say that it is a more informal environment. So what yeah. year did you design this uh, project in? This was designed in 2004, okay. 2004, yeah. And you've, you've actually mentioned a couple of times already, you're talking about the Greek temples and you spoke about the Romans. And um, interestingly, in one of our earlier chats, we were talking about the idea of this commonality between the Jain temples, the Roman temples, and um, some of the Christian churches. And yeah. you had mentioned this, again, this very, the, the, the spiritual lines that kind of bind all of them. Yeah. And you had met somebody in Mangalore. So yes. would you like to share that with us? Yes, actually that, it is a, a slightly different area that uh, related to the formal and informal, because then we go into the, uh, to the occult, which is a sort mm. of uh, not knowing uh, certain forces that exist, which was very intriguing at one stage of one's practice, because you're always looking for ideas of how people built and what was the what was the basis of starting, you know, a starting point. Uh, if you wanted to switch and get away from the great influences, then you found that uh, these. Uh, uh, recognition of what I told you that day about the ley lines, hmm. which are sort of spiritual lines that run all around the world. And they are continuous. They, they, they just uh, are always there for thousands of years. They've remained, but you can't see them. Uh, whereas magnetic lines you can because the magnet can allow you to follow them. Whereas with ley lines, you can't uh, see them unless you douse for them. And there are dowsers who are able to, uh, to show you the direction of the ley lines, which was used, uh, sorry, this slide, we can wait for this, the last slide. <laughs> uh, let's put it back to the picture, if you like, you know, to back to Milani, if you, uh, back to yeah. Milani. No, to, Mil to uh, Milani. Oh, okay. 
Yeah. So what I was saying was that um, uh, the idea of having ley lines is that it is a it is a um, uh, axes that many people used, and I mentioned that uh, the Romans used it as an axis to set their temples, and the Indians also used it, and the Jain temples used it. I'm not so sure about the other temples. They certainly have run through the length, and because I don't know about India, but they, they certainly run through India also, and you can actually douse through ley lines through any site, uh, big or small, or through a country, the ley line goes right through. But in England, for instance, they link the the uh, pinnacle of the churches, the spires, mm. uh, with ley lines. So in those days, you could see one place to the next through the spires, because they were so high that you could, uh, you know, a person walking could find. But then they had to walk on a ley line to that next uh, church. So uh, it was a bit of ancient knowledge that people had, definitely before Christianity came in. Uh, the, the the Celts and people who had know how to use to know this this language of of dowsing and what is unknown, and it is a very interesting phase to go through unknown dowsing and uh, even the process of divining water. We talked about the divining water was uh, other uh, you know other um, lines that go through a site. And then there is the movement of atoms. And that's why we should go back to the second slide. Can, can Siddhant go to the second slide? Yeah. That's an interesting point. Uh, oh, there's someone else. The second slide. Uh, this, yeah, that one. Yes, Here you can see I was trying to design a building. Actually, it was the, Indian, it was the Open University uh, competition. Uh, Indra Gandhi Open University mm -hmm. competition. Where I used the crossing of the ley lines that we doused on the site and the water uh, waterways uh, that went through the site. There were two different directions and they crossed at certain places, which became very strong energy spots. Uh, this is traditional. Everyone knows where water and ley lines meet. They become very strong spiritual centers and that's where usually they make little temples and shrines and things like that. So I thought this might be a good idea to introduce it to a university that was actually uh, broadcasting knowledge from, uh, from uh, and, and, and it would be a good thing to try and understand how the radio waves worked. So then I introduced the radio waves also into this design. <laughs> it was a bit of a fun design because it's a competition design. And so there were the movement of radio waves the uh, ley lines that were running through the site and the water uh, springs that were going, that formed this, it's not just a crazy design of sketches, it's actually forms from at uh, the atoms uh, twirling around and the water axes going through. And you'll see in the next slide, which you can put on just now, uh, the next slide, yeah, the, this is the model of the building and you see how it's come out. It's come out a bit like an, a kind of branch of a tree, you know, the, the plan. And uh, it was not meant to be that way, but it just shows that these forces do generate certain uh, form. It was just an experiment, you know, as I said, it was a competition design. So whether they took it or not, um, and it, led to an interesting form, which is what I was, then of course I left it after that because I didn't think it did make sense to try and use these forces to, uh, to create buildings. I think it was uh, just not workable. And as you see, there's a little pyramid there, these little pyramids. These pyramids also uh, are something of the occult because it, they are ancient forms and uh, knowledge that was based in, in the early days in the pyramid. I, at that time I was studying uh, what kind of um, powers the pyramids had. And the pyramids do have certain healing powers. If you actually sit inside a pyramid, you will get, uh, and, you, and you get, uh, a certain, yeah. and it's interesting to note that in, even in the Great Pyramid of, of uh, Egypt, the mummy is put exactly one third the height of the pyramid. And many years later, one of the Czech scientists found out that if you put a, a blade, an ordinary blade, 
at one third height in any kind of pyramid, but it has to be in the same proportion as the Egyptian pyramid. It will not rust. It doesn't, it, you can even keep a fruit at that one third position and it will last for weeks. Uh, this was a discovery by a Czech scientist. So there must be some kind of vibrations in that form, geometric form, that uh, creates these energies that allows a, a fruit to stay fresh. And so I think the pharaohs of that era, or the knowledge they had, they thought they would stay fresh after they died. <laughs> but it's very clear that the location of his uh, the body was put one third uh, on the pyramid. So they had the knowledge. They had the knowledge. So it's, it's very exciting, these uh, uh, you know, bits of knowledge which have been lost to the modern world. And I thought I would discover some of it. Uh, didn't go too far. It's a big study, you know, it's, it's, uh, you need to know. And all these uh, bits of knowledge have been suppressed in India. I think, mm. you know, uh, even in India, a lot of knowledge has been suppressed. And I think we should start rediscovering some of our, no, the knowledge that has always been here. Is this why, or I would ask that, why did you feel that once you came back to India, why, why did you feel compelled to steep your practice in sustainability and in, um, you know, in ideas that connected architecture with nature? I think that's the, uh, you know, natural trend. You're, so, you're given, you're drawn to nature more. And uh, uh, when, you're, when you're drawn to nature, you... Uh, then go into the whole story of sustainability and uh, using uh, simpler materials and natural materials. Uh, I'm now designing a, a, an art village in Bangalore, which is going to be totally sustain, self, self sustainable. Mm. And it is not, try, it's in fact, the buildings are trying to not even project themselves, they're trying to work with the, uh, with the, um, uh, boulders surrounding the buildings and so on. So uh, it's that aspect of um, design one is looking at, uh, you know, how you actually live with nature. I think it's very important now not to worry about the occult, but worry about what is available uh, to you immediately, you know, and, and see whether we don't destroy any more of the boulders. In fact, we are using all the boulders in this in this uh, place as part of the design uh, of the building. Yes, I saw some uh, references online where you're building around. So you're using it as a context and then you're building around it. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that's so, fascinating, yeah. But it's everything. I mean, you then you start restoring older buildings. We restored... Uh, uh, the Golconda Fort, where the boulders have been used. Hmm. If you see the Golconda Fort, the boulders have not been moved. You know, they have built the building with, with the boulders still there. So this, you know, restoring, we didn't restore it. We just made a, a kind of report to restore the building. So it's all all related, I think, with, with both the idea of nature, stone, simple material, sustainability, all that seem to now begin to work together. And one is moving away from the sort of urban scape. Hmm. I mean, I like the city bars. I like, you know, it's not as if I don't like, I escape to the city, to Delhi and Bangalore very often because certainly cities have a great uh, sense of energy. And I think even when, when talking to Charles Korea once, he said that the city is really the heart of, of civilization, of that civilization. Like, Today, I would consider Bombay being the city of India. You know, it's the place where the, all the creative things are being done, and it's also the, the commercial hub. Hmm. So it is the, it really represents India in many ways, you know, the, 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 the present culture, whatever it is. Bombay, I think, reflects it, Delhi to some extent, but Delhi, because it's got its political base, uh, it changes the complexion, whereas Bombay is very much an Indian city that represents today. I may be wrong. I think Viren might defer on that. What do you think, Viren? <laughs> Viren's a bit proper um, in Bombay being a city. You know what? Uh, I remember sitting in a boat going to the Elephanta and there were many foreigners in the boat also visiting. Yeah. 
the Elfanta case. Yeah. And some of them voice that Bombay is the only city India has. <laughs> now, I'm not so sure. I'm not so sure if one should be very proud of it. Looking at the present situation in Bombay. Yes. Um, with, with the corona as well with the rains right now. And the floods. So I feel, the planning wise, uh, planning wise it's terrible. The floods, yes. See, I, I must say that I envy you being in Goa and <laughs> I think that there has to be a certain balance between how much a place can take, how much uh, you can almost say a weight a place can take. I mean also physical weight. So I have that problem with large cities like New York also because New York has a fascination uh, with this major tall buildings. But we really don't know with the weight that we are putting on the crust of the earth, how does the, the inner, you, could, you may say, the inner soul of the earth take it? <laughs> this yes. weight that we are putting. Because I feel, I feel there are certain man-made dangers that we are providing now into the earth. And I think this high-rise and this very vertical building that are driven by speculative, speculative dealings, they are maybe not the right way of expressing future cities. And here I would like to add, very interestingly, one of our speakers, Ane Finesta, said something very nice in one of the talks that we have to now look at 21st century. 21st century looks very different from all that we did in the 20th centuries and the challenges that we had in the 20th century. And I agree with them. Maybe the idea of a city, high dense city like Bombay, New York, Singapore, maybe are no more valid in the future. And with Corona and distancing, people are really looking at these issues. That's yeah. what I think. No, I quite agree. About but, Bombay. You know, as you rightly say, Bombay. If I mean to take your argument that Bombay is the only city of of uh, India, then New York is the only city of America. I mean, it's the only yeah, city very true. That, is, uh, that represents the culture of, of modern day America and to a much nicer side of it rather than the not so good side of America. So we can debate this at some length later. Yeah. <laughs> so maybe I don't want to digress from um, yeah, yeah. Milani's uh, uh, main yeah. issues. Um, so I yep. think, uh, let me just pick up a couple of questions. We're getting comments and questions from different platforms. Um, we have Kanchan Chaudhary on Instagram who asks, how do we merge nature and building together as we know that we have limited space left to live in? He's, he's, uh, he's absolutely right. That, you know, we have too many people and too little resources. I mean, that's the basic problem. So to be idealistic and live like me in a nice uh, uh, thousand meters of land is not possible for everybody. Uh, I might have done in a microscopic way what he, you know, of what I'm wanting to do, that is to live, uh, live among the uh, trees and in the um, uh, part of uh, and live with nature. But it's not possible for everybody, and he's absolutely right, uh, you know. And, uh, but it's also uh, questionable whether you can live in a little pocket uh, flat that you see in thousands in, in, in Bombay when you drive past mm. the, the, these matchbox the buildings. Matchbox buildings. So, mm. so uh, you know, it's, it's a solution because it offers shelter. So, to answer his question, I think it's, it's not easy because there are limited resources. And the idea that we have shifted to these matchbox kind of flats, which must make life hell for those people. They'll work in hell and then they come back home to, you know, 20th floor somewhere with very little water and, uh, you know, hardly but any electricity. Interestingly, isn't that what we are saying is the city of India? <laughs> yes, you're quite right. It does provide a buzz and that's what attracts many people to Bombay. Uh, we can't deny that. But the fact is their actual living conditions are so uh, difficult. Mm -hmm. And it, it, is, uh, it is difficult to answer that completely, but it does, as a city, it still provides sufficient energy, you know. 
it does have a lot of faults. It's flooded. I mean, the flooding uh, uh, systems of Bombay are quite uh, absurd. I mean, whoever has done that, uh, they don't seem to know that the sea is right next door, but they're not <laughs> able to get the water to the sea like we do in Goa. We have no flooding here because the water just flows into the sea, even mm. if it's at the heaviest rains, you know. So uh, these are uh, problems that cities do create. But you can't deny, I mean, if you are really honest, that, uh, you know, going to Bombay or Delhi for a week or so to get your sort of fix of the city, as we call the uh, local Goans, we always want to get a little city fix. Yeah. Because we have been in the uh, countryside and beautiful nature and everything for so long. <laughs> so you can't have it all. You can't have it all. <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's the things that make the city what we want them to be as is, again, what we complain about. Yes. So you, you, can't, you can't live with it or you can't live without it either. That's what you're absolutely <laughs> putting the right way. So uh, yeah, that, yeah, the man who's asked this question has to ask himself the same question. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll pick up another uh, question. We've actually got a couple of our students uh, who you taught at TVB. Uh, uh -huh. We have Rohit Krishnagulati who says, uh, wonderful to connect with you. Um, and you actually inspired him to take up teaching after he graduated. Okay. And uh, we also have Shilpi Sinha who also took up teaching after um, she graduated. And she wants to ask uh, that TVB was started with an intent and it had a philosophy behind it. Do you think any schools of the schools that you know adhere to a philosophy and how does one take an intent and follow it through given the current scenario? You know, that's a very interesting question she has asked because when TVB was created, um, it was created to change things. The syllabus mm -hmm. was completely different. It was meant to be a sort of barefoot college, various sort of uh, things, you know, Ashish might have spoken to you about that. Uh, he really believed that he could change the way uh, we could teach architecture and so on. Uh, but what we found in the end was that it wasn't succeeding and we were beginning to produce more and more architects. And this is a great big battle between teachers. And I know she's, uh, she's the head of a school, I think. Yeah, be. she teaches at, at Sharda University. Yeah, so, so she, uh, she uh, uh, you know, uh, she must be struggling with the syllabus, which they are not, it's, it's a, it, they, they are suppressing the syllabus in these days. And when you think about it, we have, we have not been able to, TVB did try, but in the end, we succumbed to the system. So now there are something like 400 schools of architecture who are teaching the same thing, uh, five years of uh, you know, teaching, when in India there was never five years of teaching. Mm. Because you were, worked under a master or you worked, under, uh, worked on site. These were the ways you learned uh, your building trade. And some of the great craftsmen, the stone workers and all, uh, they were also designers. So we have introduced this system and we are not able to get rid of it. And this is something which is good that we are talking about. And I think I'd like to tell this to Shilpi, is that is it possible to break away from the five-year grind that all architects have to go through, even we went through it? Is it possible to become more of a, a sort of personalized thing, a bit like what happened in Shantani Of course, numbers are much smaller. In Chantan Ketan, they succeeded in teaching, uh, you know, fewer students. They didn't teach architecture, but they taught uh, painting and, and uh, sculpture and things in a kind of Guru Shishya uh, story. Uh, you worked under a master for three or four years, and it didn't matter whether you were the first year, second year. You worked in, your, in the progression of... of of learning. So as architects, I think, and designers, we have to somehow start looking at this. As your, another person said, the 21st century is the time of change. Mm. And is it possible to get away from the formality, coming back to formality to the informal, that you break away from the formality of all these very strong syllabuses and go into an informal 
It's a question I'd like to ask Shilpi. Is she possible? Can she answer it? I think Shilpi is, is with us. Shilpi, if you're here, you can just unmute yourself. Can you yourself. answer that question yourself? If she is there. Well, I'll try my level best to do it. <laughs> I've been... Uh, I've been trying to move away from the rigid curriculum that we've been following, which was laid down by, uh, you know, Reba and, you know. Uh, but uh, a lot of kids are not uh, responding to it. That's why what not? my basic problem is. Why, why not? Why, do they feel that it won't lead them into good jobs and things? Yes, because, because they feel that, you know, I mean, they do realize after years of graduating that, you know, what... Uh, uh, probably we were trying to tell them was right. But uh, right now what they're looking at is their kind of readiness for the market and, you know, things like that. Okay. Yeah, I know I know this is a problem, but is it their fault? I mean, it's not their fault also. No, they... it's not their fault. It's the overall scenario, which is... Uh... Exactly. <laughs> so we Actually can... forcing them to take that stand. Yeah. But the fact is, as, as we know now, that a, you know, a formal education in architecture doesn't necessarily get you a living because <laughs> things are changing so rapidly. You know, True. this new development that uh, they have to now maybe switch to other areas, become builders or something. You know, because I don't think it's going to be possible to employ 12,000 architects that are being churned out from the schools of architecture in India. Uh, I don't know what you think of that. Um, so it's become more about the quantity rather than the quality and yeah. it's 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 a number game finally you know each and every management is looking at uh, increasing the number of seats they're not bothered about the quality of students that you produce yeah. <laughs> they're not they're not concerned there are too many hiccups actually and well, I, I think feel, I feel, yeah. I also Sorry? feel that the council should be a bit more flexible towards, uh, you know, um, letting the schools try a number of different things that they want to. Okay. Okay. Yeah, you're quite right. I think we'll need to talk again on this. Let me get back to <laughs> Ranini because... Yeah, I mean... <clears throat> this is, Thanks, Ranalini. No, thank you, Shropi. Uh, there's some very valid points that you're bringing up. And these are, you know, these are multiple circles, vicious circles that we get caught up in whether yeah. it's uh, the density of a city or it's just the architectural education and the way it needs to be or whether it needs to evolve or not. And I think uh, to a large extent, we don't necessarily ask ourselves the right questions at the right time. But um, hopefully, hopefully we can address all of those. Um, we have a couple more questions. Uh, we've got Rajneesh from uh, Bombay. I, I'm assuming he's from Bombay who says that, do you think the construction of the new metro and the coastal road have anything to do with the terrible impact of the recent rains in Bombay? I'm not sure um, whether you'd be able to address this directly, but... I think uh, if it's... Uh, is it Rajneesh Dal by any chance? <clears throat> yes, it is. So tell him who he is, <laughs> that it's not my fault that they have made this metro. <laughs> but uh, what I'm trying to say is that it's, it's not that the metro necessarily or... What was the other question? Uh, the the, the uh, metro uh, and the coastal road. metro definitely will have an impact on flooding. Yeah. Uh, metro may not because it's at a high level. <clears throat> but, uh, there are two very well-known architects. One is called Anuradha Mathur and uh, Dilip Tikuna. Mm -hmm. who are from the SPA as a matter of interest, and they have written a paper on the, uh, on the process of not allowing uh, Bombay to flood. This they did about 10 years ago through an exhibition called SOAK. And, and they were able to provide a solution for the flooding of Bombay, but nobody actually implemented it. And it keeps flooding and they actually found a system whereby they could reduce at least the flooding to a large extent and their whole process of waterways, uh, Dilip uh, has been talking about waterways all through his life and he was very clear in this very large exhibition which was held at, in, in, at the uh, Museum of Modern Art in, in Bombay actually provided a solution. And that's what I find very interesting as, as you know, that nobody really wants to listen to this. Because we are drowning uh, in bureaucracy. Bureau Sorry, the bureaucracy. They were stuck yeah. with some engineer and uh, they, they weren't able to implement it. And even though the chief minister had suggested that, that they, they follow the, uh, 
a guideline that these people are such. It wasn't possible to implement it. So that doesn't answer his question, but it uh, it does answer that the coastal road will make an impact, and uh, flooding is going to be a perennial problem unless they take some action <clears throat> that means uh, reducing it. I think we'll pick up one more question before we uh, try to come back to our conversation. Um, Sumana Shivatya from Instagram is asked, is saying, Sir, thank you so much for talking about energy elements and the occult in architecture. How does one get deeper into this? Could you please suggest some resources? So in fact, at the end of the chat, um, I was going to ask if you could recommend some readings. So yeah. if you can suggest any books or any uh, resources that you would like our audience to reference, we can put them up as a list um, on well, the chat. Uh, regarding the cult, I don't know. There is, of course, the very famous book on the Egyptian pyramid done by a man called Tomkins, uh, which is uh, gives you all the insights into the whole uh, process of the design and building of the pyramids and their magical power. They have certain mm. magical powers, which I don't know fully about. I don't know enough about it. But if anyone really wants to go into the occult, then they, they have to learn how to douse with the pendulum. And there are many books available on learning how to uh, use a pendulum. I know how to use it and it takes a little bit of practice, but a pendulum can find you water and ley lines as a starting point. It connects with a sort of, as they say, the, 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 the pendulum connects with a sixth sense of yours. Which, which is then gives you a certain degree of knowledge, which is there in you, but it brings it out. And I think the first step towards the occult is to learn how to use a pendulum. So let your friend uh, use a pendulum or get a book on pendulum and get one from Amazon. They're available on Amazon, these pendulums. I bought one. So <laughs> she can start learning. It's quite simple. And then she'll know how the magical powers are available within the body, which I have not done for a long time. And I might start now, thanks to people like, you know, having this conversation. <laughs> um, Ram, could you Maybe just I repeat the name something. of the... Uh, sorry, Varin, just a quick thing. Uh, Ram, yeah, if you could completed. just repeat the name of the, the pyramid book. So we'll, um, we'll put it on the site. I mean, you have to go to Google and just put uh, pyramid, uh, you know, uh, the, <clears throat> The great, the great Pyramid, if she Googles the, the Great, great Pyramid, pyramid okay. then she should find a series of books on that, yeah. Okay, Virain, you had something to say? Yeah, since I'm audible, because there was in between a problem with my... Yes, your, your uh, connection is a little weak, say, but you should be okay. Wait a minute, I'll just switch off my video. Yeah, I'll go directly. Helps. Um, to answer on the occult, occult uh, data on occultism, uh, there is a wonderful BBC series. It's about seven of them about the pyramid. And oh. it's called, Ramu must be familiar with it. It's a fabulous research. No, no. I've never seen. It is, it is called the Pyramid Code. And what you, Ramu, were earlier mentioning, the healing powers of these little uh, mm -hmm. gangways. I don't know what you call these little tunnels within the pyramid, yes. these tunnels yeah. were actually used to put a patient within yeah. certain coordinates yeah. and music was played to them. So these tunnels, oh. as many people earlier thought, these yeah. tunnels were certain escape routes after the pyramids were made and then they were buried. They yeah. actually were active, you could say, hospitals, mm -hmm. besides being many other things. and. I think the, the best research is being done by, or the most intensive research is being done by French and by Egyptian, uh, I don't know how you call it, archaeologists probably, who are decoding the okay. multiple faces of the pyramid. And I think the series has something beautiful to reveal also, that there are similarities of Indian culture okay. and the Hindu culture with the Egyptian culture and another countries in middle of Africa at the same yeah. time. The similarities that they have revealed lately, I mean, I'm talking about 2019, 2018 and 2019 are startling. There's oh, so, much of, so much of similarities about karma, so much of uh, similarities about uh, life after death and the rebirth cycle. It is all inscripted as well in the pyramids. 
through certainly the hero plays and uh, please watch it it's a must watch no it's it's nice that you have mentioned this because i haven't been following it and i think i pre discovered over the last few months sitting at home some of these ideas it's, as you know it's a lifetime bit yeah. of knowledge you know to learn about these things and one needs to follow it fairly carefully but as you rightly say the knowledge base of these older civilizations is what my concern was you know that they knew things that we don't know about you know we consider ourselves a very advanced uh, you know scientific civilization but there are factors and now being come out if this uh, the series i certainly watch it after uh, after this to know exactly how these older civilizations were able to use their knowledge certainly healing powers were very much uh, dwelled upon you know in these in these uh, pyramids and other forms of of cure and i think to mix healing with building is is an interesting uh, way and i cert- certainly think it's worth discussing at some stage but it's the idea of having knowledge that is no longer available that must be discovered <laughs> yeah yeah so ramu tell me i'm curious at what point or how did you chance upon um these ideas what well, did you do in that very simply i was designing a a, a, a school for a very interesting american lady called sophie tenbrook i have written that in my book which is going to come out hopefully next year uh, and she asked me to design a school in in bangalore and she was very open to uh, to um, living uh, and working in india she was born here her, her american parents came to bombay and started a bookshop and uh, then in the 30s or i don't know when 20s or 30s when she was born and she grew up in india now she no more but she um, started a school in in uh, bangalore and she also started the uh, the the philosophical society of bangalore so she was very connected to all these things and so she asked me to design a new school Mm-hmm. which would reflect some of her thinking and the way that we should teach it's a very famous school in bangalore local the east west school so but she then taught me the uh, something about dowsing and and uh, and uh, the uh, idea of a pyramid because of the magical powers that vrinda was talking about so i began to look start looking at it more and more deeply of how we can work with it to create different spaces it didn't work but uh, i did try and that's how i went into it and the one of the offshoots of that was to learn about the uh, batch flower remedies which i also write about in my book now the batch flower remedies is what she discovered uh, through dowsing and other means that you can use flowers to actually cure most diseases all these bit of knowledge are still somewhat rare if you google batch flowers and all those who are listening in just google batch flowers you'll find that these they were uh, they were discovered by an englishman who was an actually an allopath but he found that the allopathic medicines were not working so he discovered his own set of medicines and uh, that was another offshoot of sophia tenbrook's teachings she believed and she did all her curing through the batch remedies and certainly in today i have a lady who in goa who's a practitioner she's an english woman she is uh, very confident that uh, the present virus uh, it can be cured by, by uh, flower remedies but nobody listens nobody wants to listen in today's world as yeah. as shilpi was saying nobody the youngsters want to do their own thing so you can't stop them you know they i mean if they believe they don't believe in batch remedies and they go to the normal remedies which are not curing the virus but as we have well, you know both homeopathy and batch remedies which are able to cure but nobody wants to use them i mean we are going into a different areas of discussion <laughs> but but it's related to architecture in a sense you know because we are going through this rather difficult period 
I think what's interesting is that all of us, um, given the current scenario, are all in the same boat. And yeah. it, one doesn't distinguish from the other and one is not distinct from the other. Um, and it's also, it's a matter of kind of taking your chances. And chances are something that we spoke about earlier as well. And um, something that I had asked you that, you know, obviously there's certain through our journeys, all of us, we, we reach crossroads, we reach certain points where we have to take decisions, where we have to start to yeah. identify for ourselves what we want to do and why we want to do them. Yeah. And um, I was just like coming back to your earlier journey, you came back to India and I'd be curious to ask, and this is something that I, um, I think it's a social experiment for me because I studied abroad and I chose to come back to India. Yeah. So I'm, I'm always curious to know why people choose to come back here and especially right after they study. And also once you come back, then how do you establish yourself and what are the decisions, what are the chances that you took on yourself to, you know, to kind of save your path? ahead well part of it is chance as we talked about chance i was offered i was had a very good job in the middle east and was earning vast sums of money and but it was very hard work and then and then i was offered a job in indonesia to to run a project there and they also a fat salary so but then that salary then that, that that job sort of collapsed at the last minute and i felt this was a good moment to leave, you know, not live in outside India and come back to India and see whether there was a chance of working here and, and finding ways to, to do something interesting, which I think is, is what many architects would return back. Because we belong here, you know, when you live abroad, as you know, you might have lived abroad, you never belong to that. Hmm. You never belong here, though. Uh, in, the, in your own country, you belong here. You can get on a, uh, on a train and you, you're part of the buzz. Whereas when you get onto a train in, say, London or New York or wherever we go to, uh, you never are one, uh, you know, one with that country. I'm sure you felt that when you lived in Canada. And when you, but when you're here, you're even though we are such a multilingual race, we still feel a sense of comfort. You might complain bitterly about the politicians, about everything else, but the fact is that um, it is a place where we feel comfortable, at least I do. For your work here, and look at the opportunity. Look at the opportunity we have. I have a client who's allowing me to design anything in this art village. He said, do what you want, you know. Can you imagine a Western client giving you that opportunity? It's not possible. And he, you know, he is a, a builder. So he even one of my other houses, he just built it, you know, whatever you, you design. So but he's taking a chance on you. Sorry? He's taking a chance on you. He's taking a chance, yes. He, he was the one who built my orange house. So now he okay. built all his houses. He built many houses. And we just have fun. It's not being a proper architect, I know, but uh, you know now I don't think one needs to worry. There are enough good architects who can handle the serious work. You know, building. My brother is a hospital architect, mm. and uh, you know he built several hospitals. So there are enough such uh, responsible architects who will uh, build the buildings that are necessary. You know, whether it's airports, hospitals, things like that. Uh, they are necessary, I'm not saying that, but there are people like me who are just having fun, you know, and uh, hopefully some of this work will be seen in my book and maybe some architects will start saying, well, we also want to have a little bit of fun. You know? Not a, you know, so it all depends and that's why I was very interested in Shilpi's point that some of these young, and I've also been to many juries, and they think you're talking to your hat, you know, many of these guys, they don't know what you're saying. And I'm very curious, some of the people who are listening in today, uh, they, they might say, you know, is this chap off his, you know, uh, because it's not the normal route. And I think it's time now to break away from the normal route. I think we have to break away from the present version of civilization, of industrialization, of economic wealth, all these things. These are not related to architecture, but it does affect us in some way or the other, you know, because we are the builders. 
we reflect the civilization. Of course. How it's taking us. Um, in, in fact, uh, I mean, coming back to what Shilpi was saying earlier, I used to teach at the Sushant School of Art and Architecture. And yeah. my, the first year that I was teaching there, the first class we had uh, with the new batch, and we all, you know, they were asked why we decided to, um, or no, sorry, during the orientation, I think one famous architect was invited to address this batch of new students. And uh, yeah. the floor was open to questions. And I would say eight out of 10 students yeah. The one question that they wanted to ask is, how much am I going to get paid when I graduate? <laughs> exactly. And, you know, so it's this whole idea of the, the marketplace, which Mr. Ganju very interestingly defines. <clears throat> but then again, we're, you know, we're, we're constantly teetering on this dichotomy of who to cater to and what Just to okay. cater to. I mean, you, can, you can't blame them also. They also want to earn a living. They want to yeah. get on with their life. They want to buy a car. They want to buy whatever. I mean, we all did the same. You can't, so you can't completely grudge a young architect wanting to earn more money. We are the poorest paid people, as you know. You know, young yeah. architect after five years has been hardly anything. And uh, they have to work day and night. And eventually they might make some money, not too much. But uh, uh, so, so I think it's a difficult uh, problem for many youngsters today because of the wealth. And as you rightly say, where did that question come from? Mm. You know, how much money am I going to get? Where did he think about it? And how did that idea come up? You, as I say, I don't blame him because he may not have had other opportunities like many of us have had. And you know, the opportunity of experiencing a great deal more so we are able to maybe not worry too much about how much money we're going to make at the end of the month. But it does trouble you. I mean, even today I have to pay my salaries. And I'm sure you have to too. Yeah. You know? No doubt. Vireen, would you like to add anything considering you've also been, uh, you've kind of played that role as well? As a practicing feel, um, Sorry? That as an architect and think... a teacher. Yeah, but uh, I mean, this payment issue is, of course, bothering <laughs> everybody. But, uh, and unfortunately, I would like to add there, as a student joins architecture, there's one way of handling this, is to give a warning across that you'll never make big money. I mean, so all the illusions are, and then- Shattered on day matter, one. <laughs> <laughs> no, but you could do something. All the idea that architecture is a base for making money, should be removed and filtered out. So those who are right. still sincere, sincere about pursuing a profession, uh, yeah. which, and Ganju said it very nicely last time, which is away from the business, to uh, the idea that you're working within an environment and you want to make out of contributing to the environment, uh, money is, has a certain, uh, I would say, paradox in it. Because on one hand, we are saying we want to contribute to the environment, enhance the quality and be sensitive yeah. with the nature. On the other side, you are saying, but I want to still take something out of the nature that is make money. <laughs> so if you want to make serious money, then I think you should not be a teacher. That's one. You should not be a musician or a poet. And I think nearly all creative fields have this dilemma. It's With, not limited to, to architecture. I would, I would actually have to object over here because I feel that, you know, you're you making can, good money. You can be an artist and you can, you can create, you can, uh, you know, pursue your creative field, but that doesn't mean that you can't be valued for it and you cannot be rewarded for it monetarily. And I think that is where we have gotten stuck a little bit because we've just come to accept that creativity cannot be paid for. And it's unfortunate because if, why should one be divorced from the other? And why should we say that people who are going to be creating things and who are going to be pursuing creative um, acts or vocations should not be rewarded for their, for their talent or their skill or, their, uh, or what they contribute to the environment? Absolutely. I tell you why. I think there is a good answer for that. But Ramu, I don't want to, I mean, Ramu is a <laughs> chief guest today. But just like, do you know what? Your mind gets, Sooner or later, I wouldn't say necessarily, this is a bit harsh, corrupted, that you can make more and more money by moving in a certain direction. Say, if you find 
And that's what builders are doing. If they find that a model, a house model, say in the city today, uh, borrowed from Singapore, it's a, it's a successful model, they will keep on reproducing it, giving the architect lesser chance to explore and be creative. In fact, money kills creativity, the real genuine creativity. I'm not saying, there are few who can resist it, but most of us will most probably fall in the trap of, of making it convenient and comfortable once the business rolls. That's my call on creativity. Absolutely right. I mean, but you know, you said poets, uh, poets uh, don't make much money and many of them don't, but they continue because that is what their great talent is and their contribution to the world is to write poetry. And of course, the greatest of them all was uh, Tagore and Tagore spent all his Nobel Prize money towards, uh, you know, supporting Shantaniketan because there was no money available in Shantaniketan. So, uh, so he put in all that money. And so, you know, uh, it is a problem. Each of these people, poets and uh, musicians and dancers, some of them make millions. I mean, <laughs> so it's not necessary that, uh, and this is something interesting. I don't know whether we are getting to the end of the conversation, but, uh, Manan, but I wanted to say, and this is again something that I've been thinking about, is that uh, when I was a young student, we, uh, in our School of Architecture, we uh, had a big dance at the end of the year. And we invited a, a group of uh, dropouts, architecture dropouts, all of them are architecture dropouts. So the, uh, the uh, school felt, well, we should give this band a chance. And they went on to become the Pink Floyd. Pink Floyd are all architects. Yeah. So you can imagine how wealthy they are. <laughs> so, so you can make money, but not necessarily. <laughs> well, I guess that's, that's where the idea of patronage comes in, perhaps. Of course, yeah. No, patronage is a very important thing. I think this modern civilization, it does not have the, as much patronage as it could be. Like, uh, you know, Frank Gehry's Bilbao Museum, where mm. the Getty, you know, what, is it the Getty Foundation that paid for it? Um, the Bilbao Museum. Uh, it's a really, you know, iconic work of architecture of the modern world, but completely paid for by uh, one individual. So I think that does make a difference, you know, when you have someone with a vision. And uh, I think we also need that at this moment of time. And this civilization might bring in a, great, a, a number of patrons because otherwise I don't see how we are going to uh, move forward in a, in, a, in a more creative manner. I mean, they pay, they pay large sums for art. Hmm. You know, a lot of Indians are paying large sums for art, but they will quibble for, you know, when it comes to so building the house. How are we going so we're not uh, quite sure what, why this is the case. <laughs> so uh, these are issues that I don't know, I, we, we, we can discuss later, but I think, Maybe we should talk about, back, go back to architecture and, 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 and maybe end on that. What do you think? But uh, no, like the idea, what I was trying to say is that, you know, it, I think patronage is, is important. And I think that is what would also help us break out of this cycle. Um, like you yourself said, the client that you have been working with for so many years, you've done so much and today has the confidence and yeah. is willing to kind of invest the time, energy and the funds in a project and allows you that open hand to do what you think would be right because they have, um, you know, they, they have that trust in you. Absolutely, absolutely. Because, you know, it's a rare man who starts off as a builder and I wish I had invited him, but he's, you know, on this talk. Uh, it's a rare man who gives you five acres of land and fairly prime land in a beautiful rocky, you know, rocky um, landscape. Hmm. Uh, to build an art village for, for artists and dancers and, and, uh, and musicians to come and perform. And this is what we are trying to do to re give it like a bit like Santin Ketan, bring back the humanities. So he's willing to spend all that much money. He doesn't have a vast amount, but he's willing to spend towards this quest and allows you to experiment with spaces and, and other forms of uh, 
uh, ways to go through the build and the design keeps changing. So we use water bodies. We, now we are using uh, water, uh, water lines that's coming back. And uh, we are using the, uh, the concept of the trident. It's, it's, a very, uh, it's a very sacred place. So uh, here is a man who's willing to take these chances. You know, and that's, that is really very important. And I do believe that this little village one day, maybe not in Atna, but one day, my hope is that there will be enough uh, opportunity for young musicians and young, uh, um, even poets. In fact, uh, there was a poet uh, who actually inaugurated the art village. He now teaches at the new university, Vishnu. Uh, and, he, and he recited his poetry in, in Korea. Mm. So uh, we have provided that platform. It is not a visual, it's not a virtual platform. It is here as a chance of people coming and living in these places and working with creative people, hoping that, uh, you know, they'll be able to, you know, fulfill their dreams really of, of, of their creativity. So here's a the patron is able to do that. And that's why I find a great respect for him. <laughs> and I think that that becomes a tool, right? And it, it becomes a point of encouragement for the younger generation to look out for these opportunities and also encourages them to not lose hope because there, there are people like this out there and there are um, possibilities like this, perhaps. Of course, not everyone gets them all the time, but uh, yeah. there are options. <laughs> but, you know, you, we have to look at Tagore again because... You know, here was a man who was able to see this. And look what he has given us in the last century. What great poets, what great painters, what he's given us. So not that we are going to be Tagos, but, you know, at least we are make, you know, some of us can make an attempt to give this opportunity because there's some tremendous talent out there. And unless they come out, where will we go, you know, in the humanities? The humanities have to now um, help us create better architecture that can come through patronage. And, you know, like even when you go back to my book, Cosmic Dance, where I talk about Krishnadevaraya, the great warrior king, he was a poet. Mm. And uh, as a poet, he, in, uh, he invited a large number of builders, architects, uh, you know, designers and sculptors to the city of Hampi and created the city of Hampi uh, with, this, with this in mind. Hmm. So that kind of scale of patronage is possible, but we, you know, uh, we are going through the, this wealth creation route, which as you know, I won't name the people who, uh, but a man who can make money of the kind and build the ugliest building in Bombay <laughs> is, is something to be slightly worried about. <laughs> Well, there's that, but we can also be optimistic and look at all the other things that people are doing across the country. And um, also just, you know, wanting to talk about a little bit about your books. You've already yeah. published two and they're available. Um, Siddhant, if you can just put, I think you've already put them or if you can put them on the chat. Um, both of them are available on Amazon. They're absolutely gorgeous. Um, but I'm very intrigued by the next book that you're publishing and you said will be up. Uh, will be available next year, if you could just tell us a little bit about that. Well, uh, it's, it's a bit like what we're talking about just now. That's why I'm so happy to be on the show, is that it's a very personalized uh, story of how things evolved, how does, you know, one's approach to design and the way that we can uh, live, live our lives. Because we all live to work and try to fulfill and not be you know, when I say I live in Goa, I really fulfill a concept that I believed in. And these are the sort of thoughts I'm trying to put together. Of course, one talks about some uh, very beautiful uh, uh, monasteries, pilgrimages. I talk about my pilgrimages to some of the great uh, monasteries of the world in Bhutan, in Greece, and even in Italy. So these monasteries are such absolutely wonderful places where people live in isolation and solitude to find themselves, you know, and they build these amazing buildings in the middle of nowhere. 
using techniques which are, I mean, there's a monastery in Greece that actually sits on a rock. So, uh, so how they brought the building, you know, the, the, the buildings, the, the building materials up there is, is what I talk about in the new mm. book. I also talk about travelers. There is this story about uh, a man who walked across Europe looking at all the buildings, he had no money. And uh, he, he has built a building in, in Greece uh, where using, you know, donkeys to bring all the stones because no one could bring the stones to this really majestic site where he built his own house. And he didn't use an architect. He built, he built it himself merrily. And, and that has been used in your fuel. You know, there's a very famous movie called... Uh, you know, this tri tri the, those trio series, that romantic series where the American meets a French girl. Uh, sunrise, breakfast, you know, before sunrise, before, you know, that series. And there's one called Before Midnight, which is the last part, of, where this uh, house is the main backdrop of the movie. Hmm. So here we have a non-architect, you know, who's a travel writer building a building, using donkeys to build his materials. So it's that kind of thing I'm talking about, <laughs> which might interest architects and say that, you know, that it's possible to live and design and make really beautiful buildings uh, without uh, necessarily having formal knowledge of architecture. Whereas equally, the, um, the visiting the Pantheon in Rome, one of the really great mm -hmm experiences in one's life is to visit the Pantheon and see how the light comes into the Pantheon, which is done by a Roman architect and uh, a great formal building. So, you know, I think there are many uh, wonderful uh, interactions of, and that's why architecture and, we're, you know, we all have become architects is because it has also given us so much. And this is what I'm trying to say. You know, I know we have a bust many days, we were broke, we never knew how to pay for many things, which all the other our contemporaries were merrily buying new cars and this and that, whereas we had to buy second-hand cars. Uh, so, but this conversation confirms that we all enjoyed the process and how much it has given us, you know, and going to the Greek island, for instance, normal person will not fully understand mm -hmm. the quality of spaces in a Greek island. Whereas we as architects, I think, enjoy it that much more. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> if, I, I find it very interesting that you call non-architects um, or you refer to architects and normal people. <laughs> <laughs> non-architects are normal people and normal. then we are architects. <laughs> well, it's a bit like that, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> well, I wouldn't say we are a step above or below, but we're definitely a step removed from that. Of course, <laughs> we're a step removed. But we enjoy, as long as we enjoy our life, and I think this is what my book is all about, is it's a full life, you know, whether you sail up the Nile or whether you, um, you know, go on the Asian, uh, you know, uh, Asian seas or go to Bali and spend a, in amongst the temples of Bali, which we haven't talked about, but they're absolutely the most wonderful thing to do mm. is, is these, uh, 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 these bits of architecture, which are so Indian and so uh, Balinese. Uh, these are things that need to be discussed. And this is what I'm talking about a little bit. Yeah. And philosophy, philosophy we can't leave. Yeah. You know, uh, how, what, are your, what are your beliefs? What are your spiritual beliefs? And, you know, we have had people like me have been fortunate, like Ashish, to meet the Dalai Lama, uh, you know, to build for him. So if you build for him, then you, you're in a different uh, position of having to think through. I mean, Pradeep, my ex, uh, you know, who built the temple for the Dalai Lama, Pradeep Sashteva, who we have not mentioned, who's been part of my life and who passed away in May. And his legacy of building the Chanichok, uh, you know, pedestrian route, which is now going to, to, in my mind, change Delhi. I think he made huge contributions. And Pradeep certainly did. Of course, uh, yes. You know, public spaces, he's done 
huge things. So I think we as architects uh, have a pretty good life. And a big responsibility as well. Well, well, we reflect the civilization. I mean, what remains, what remains in a civilization, it's not even the paintings, some sculpture and mostly buildings, mostly ruins. So uh, I think the architects play a huge role, although we are not quite the, you know, the, uh, the, we are the skill. Like for instance, the Roman Emperor uh, Hadrian, when he built cities, he built many cities in, in Turkey and in Egypt and so on. But it was some master planner who did them. Mm. He, but he was the patron and he gave them the opportunity. So we are actually slightly instrumental. We are not, you know, we are not, we need the, the king. You know, then only we can do our job. That, don't you think? I mean, most definitely. We love you beyond that. Most, most definitely, like we said. So, I think at some level we are a facilitator where we, will, we, can, we can facilitate the process and we can make it happen. But you need that, uh, you need someone to ignite the process for us. Yeah, yeah. That's true, yeah. Virain, would you like to add anything? Yeah, but I would add to this. I think we need a king with a certain, and Ramu said that very beautifully, with a certain vision. Yeah. And the vision is for the entire civilization now. The context is, can be a smaller context, but it is, uh, can be a larger context. And there I may, some, maybe this is little uh, controversial, but for me, making a temple in Ayodhya is certainly not a vision that I sub personally subscribe, especially in the 21st century. However beautiful that piece of architecture can be, I think there is a role that a, a, a a king, a king has to play, which is, which is mapping carefully uh, the context that you are living and the trend that the entire ecosystem demands. And I think um, I'm also in favor of the king very often because I agree with you. The patronage is very essential for, for beauty very, very important for beauty. And uh, I think you, you are all, I mean, I went through the, through the uh, picture of your, uh, on the website, I went to, through some uh, sketches of yours. And I felt if I may, generally, I don't want to name it, but if I may say, you are actually in the truest form, a romantic. Yes. May I use that? because I saw this beautiful book lying on your table in one of the pictures, which, which had the title, Pleasure of Ruin, right? If yes. I'm not mistaken. And I remember from 19th century, middle 19th century, maybe the period of Rousseau, where yes. he talks about back to nature, and yes. even the period of paintings in middle 19th century in Germany had with Caspar David Friedrich, one of the ardent, uh, what do you call ex one of the ardent painter in the 19th century in Germany who really painted ruins, who painted things that and withdrew beauty out of the ruins. Of course. Would you like to say a bit, little bit about that? Well, because you have a huge you know, affinity it, for for that. It's interesting that you should raise that. I, I didn't. I knew that it was one of my pictures, and. Um, it was a picture that uh, again Joginder uh, has photographed. He, I don't know if he's still Beautiful here. Picture. Might have left by now, but no, he's here. He's here. He's still there. <laughs> but uh, he, he captured that picture of my it's desktop. It is my desktop. So yeah. he wanted that to be the screen of the desktop. So it happened to have that book, The Pleasure of Ruins, which is my most uh, most favorite book. It's been written by a lady called Rose Macaulay. The original version is very difficult to find. This. Uh, this is another version. And she toured the uh, world uh, in those days, in the 19th century, uh, looking at ruins and, and describing them. And, and, and she describes them to say that how much pleasure they, and that's why that book is so beautiful. And the fact is that ruins are, very, are perhaps the best part of, of architecture is when you're building falls apart. I'm just saying this as a 
the point of interest because most buildings, even the great ones, are finally, uh, you know, decay, just like us. Yeah. Uh, you know, we decay. And so we get into the area of philosophy where, uh, you know, it represents some form of death that uh, the ruin of, of, of a building and why that's why it's so beautiful. And that's what uh, Rose Macaulay is talking about. She's talking about buildings that offer you not just pleasure, but a reminder that, that it all is, comes to an end and it all falls apart. And this is what is left. So some of these great uh, cities that we are going to build, you know, eventually, even the new temple, I shouldn't raise this. One day it will not be there. It's being built today. But yeah. one day it will go. And, uh, you know, just like the old one went. So, um, so I think we should remember the cycle of life and death. And architecture represents it so beautifully in ruin, in the form of decay and, you know, in the form of that. I think I, in my other uh, lecture the other day, I spoke about the kingdom of Guj. It's a beautiful Tibetan kingdom, which is now in ruin. But it was on the Silk Route. It's one of the most beautiful cities that uh, that uh, was made and now in, in ruin. So I think ruins are a very important part of, of, you know, this, what we talked about earlier, a sense of presence and a sense of going back to Khan. Uh, he, I think, really wants his I am to be in ruin. That's his main uh, idea. One day he wants it to fall down so that he, then he would have completed his building. <laughs> I mean, this is just a theory, but I think that's roughly what he would like to do. Yeah. You know, about a new building, a case. Would you like to keep these ruins then there? Or would you like to see them removed? After What's all, that? they should stay. Would you like to have them there then? You, you should not want to have them removed then, these it ruins. Part. The ruins. The ruins. The ruins. Oh, yeah, they should stay oh. there, no? I mean, can you imagine uh, the IIM in ruin? Would it be a much be. better building than what it is now? <laughs> I mean, let's be honest, it's, you know, it, it would be much better to walk through it as a ruin rather than walk through it now as it's a beautiful building. I'm not saying it's not. It's a great yeah. building. One of the best buildings in India, I would imagine. Of course, then I'm a Khan believer. But uh, there are very few buildings in India which you really go all the way to see. Yeah. Some of the times I used to ask my students, how many kilometers will you go to see a great building? And certainly you'd go and see the Ahmedabad. You'll catch a plane specifically to go and see that building. Whereas you might not do it for many modern buildings. Yeah. Even the ones in the West. <laughs> I, I may be wrong. I, I'm just raising no, a point. Yeah. So is it a good idea to design a building today from the perspective, how does it look like a ruin? Well, then it should look beautiful a, doing it, as a ruin. It, 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 then it won't be a ruin. I think that is contradictory. I think, you know, it, 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 you're building it to be, to last forever. Yeah. So you, you're building it to last forever and uh, you don't realize that, you know, a thousand years or a hundred years from now, it will fall down. Um, that is uh, something which is uh, which is uh, some which I think we are little not you know when we start building these magnificent edifices, it is and I think uh, many people uh, even in Gautam has shown Gautam Bhatia has shown the yeah. Secretariat in ruin in yeah. one of his sketches mm -hmm. and one day it's going to be a ruin. There's no doubt. I mean when we go to Mandu or when we go to Hampi and we go to all these buildings. Uh, they are all in a. They must have been magnificent buildings when they were, uh, when they were uh, fully there. But even in ruin, they are, they look so well, you know. Yeah. So, so I don't know. I, I mean, I, I it's, these are things that one just ponders about a little bit. And that particular book, *Pleasure of Ruins*, will will uh, uh, tell the story rather more clearly than I'm putting it. Well, then it would beg to question the idea of uh, referencing these ruins to build again. Like you have, you have the Nalanda University, which is now being rebuilt. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, the language that you use and, and what kind of architecture that you employ to redo these spaces. 
It's a very good question because when you do see the new design of Nalanda, you find that the architect has not been very you know, sympathetic to the uh, old brick uh, structure of Nalanda. He just put a massive big building there, you know, and uh, without thinking for a minute that, uh, you know, um, what Nalanda stood for and the monastery that it was and the great place of learning. Of course, they've tried now to build this new building, but it's just another modern building. Mm. It has no feeling whatsoever. And this is slightly tragic, or slightly very tragic. <laughs> so, <laughs> but so modern architects, we have to really think a lot. And I think this is the beginning. I mean, we are discussing it to maybe come towards that direction, or at least be aware of places like Nalanda, which are just such wonderful places, you know. Mm. I'm sorry I have to go back to the past as examples, but you know, modern architecture does not inspire. You know, if you can give me one modern building in India and the one good building which, we, which Raj Reval built, that's been pulled down. You know, the, so, so what chance do we have from the, from the patronage point of view when they pull down the National Hall of, I mean, it's ending on a rather a pessimistic note, though we were trying to be optimistic. But when you pull down the Hall of Nations, then what does it say about the kingship, you know? Uh, it means nothing. Mm. It, it, I think that was one of the great modern Indian buildings. It did not, it wasn't Corbusian, it was purely, you know, modern Indian building. I don't know whether you'd agree, but uh, it was completely unique. But like you say, then it becomes a reflection of the leadership and of the kinship. And, and yeah. then because the power and the authority lies in certain hands to decide what remains, what doesn't, what can be, uh, you know, can be maintained as ruins or what will have to just be demolished and wiped away. Yeah. Because of the, like somebody else said, right? I mean, there is that much space. So yeah. someone decides at some point that, okay, are we going to wipe the slate clean and are we going to build from scratch? Or right. are we going to allow our earlier buildings to fall to ruins and let them take, a, take up the space? Which means then we're clearing more space for more buildings because our, our desires and our wants and our needs are not going to stop. No, I think, I think every civilization is reflected in its buildings and this, in, in the, the reconstruction of Nalanda is a good case to, in your, your argument that we need to rebuild Nalanda. We need to put a new university there. It can't just lay in a ruin. That I'm agreement with. And, uh, but the question is, how do we approach the design aspect mm -hmm. of it? How does it reflect our present civilization? Uh, that is the question we must ask uh, ourselves because we are moving from a postmodern age to a more aware age, an age of virtual communication, an age of, uh, of a different form of living. Already it's happening. So will that reflect in our new buildings and, and the limited space we have and the problems which are perhaps quite complicated, you know, to live with this large numbers that we are playing with. And uh, he, these are very difficult questions. I, I don't know how I, I am not the right person to answer them uh, because I haven't, I don't know much about urban planning and other aspects of it. I'm, all I'm saying is that civilization has to be, it has to have some beauty in it. I mean, like mm -hmm. someone said about the metros, the metro is ruined by Anglo city. Yet it has brought, it takes, each person who has to take one half hours to come to office, now he can come in 15 minutes. Mm -hmm. So these are the questions that uh, we have, you know, but it's ruined the face of the city and made Bangalore into an ugly metropolis. So these are the questions we have to ask ourselves, you know, how we are going to balance these two. And the future looks tremendous that way. You know, uh, and, and and our country especially. I mean, India is is a really fascinating and uh, great kind of mix of a nation, which is why we all return. I think. <laughs> <laughs>
Well, I think uh, we've actually crossed the two-hour mark. So, two-hour mark. Uh, I think, yeah, I was beginning to. <laughs> <laughs> because I, I know that this conversation can go on and there is just so much to discuss. There are a lot of things that we haven't even touched upon. Okay. But um, I do hope that, you know, we can continue this at another time. But I think for today, um, we are going to wrap up. And with a lot of hope in our hearts and uh, with a lot of encouragement from you, Ramu, I think it's been a really fabulous conversation. It's been insightful. It's been very encouraging. And um, it's been honest. And I think that's something that we always appreciate. But yeah. thank you so much on behalf of our entire audience on Instagram, Facebook, Zoom, on behalf of Matra Architects, Virain and myself. I, I would really um, express a lot of gratitude for you to take out your time and yeah. to join us. Uh, and I end this by saying that you know, the format you've produced has produced this kind of conversation. Otherwise, you wouldn't have had it. We would normally talk about architecture, we talk about buildings, but we do not talk the items related to buildings. And I think we've had a lot of fun, at least I have had. So I want to thank you for that. <laughs> thank you so much. No, that's very encouraging to hear. Okay, okay. Viren, would thank you like you, to Ramu. add anything? Yeah, yeah. Hello. Yeah, I feel somehow when I look at Ramu's journey now, he started traveling with his parents across the world. And now in between, he was the, the person wanting to build a lot. And now as he's beautifully aging, He's back to being a traveler and an explorer. And, I find that, and an explorer. And he's unlike a child, maybe. I don't know how he was as a child, but I'm sure very sensitive, very careful. And today also, while he's moving on his new site in in Humpy, or I saw some clippings. I think where the this huge where the school or the learning center is happening. Bangalore. He's walking. He's walking very gently, very carefully over the, the crust of the earth. And I think it's so beautiful to see that happen. And I think that's the biggest learning I got while, while going through the document that Ramu has put on the site and while listening to him today. There is an immense amount of care. And I think his voice, I must compliment him for that, his voice speaks actually about the care. That's very There's good. immense <laughs> gentleness about you, which people in today's world should learn. That's my... Yeah. strong feeling, the humbleness and the gentleness towards our environment. And I think it comes through a lot of penance, a lot of insight into our relation of humans to the nature and to the larger surrounding. And I can see that, I can sense it actually while listening to you. That's so thank kind. you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you. <laughs> and thank can you. we now press the leave button or uh, we can press the leave button? Sure. Yes. I just want to take this opportunity uh, to apologize to anyone whose questions we might have missed. Uh, we're getting a lot of comments and questions. So in case uh, you'd like to reach out, please uh, message. Either you can message Matra Architects or me on Instagram, Facebook or email. And we'll try to uh, get in touch with Ramu to answer some of your questions. Um, yeah. Also, I'd just like to thank Siddhant and Ankit for all their help and support in this entire production. They've, they're our backbones. And once again, Ramu, thank you so much for joining us today. And we really hope that we can speak with you soon again. Lovely, lovely having you, Ramu. Take care in, in the go on uh, monsoon till then. Hope things don't <laughs> flood over. Come out. The sun has come out. You can have a look at it. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. <laughs> that is, that, yeah, that looks warmer than Delhi right now. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good. Lovely. Great. Thank you for Thank everything. Thank you so much. All the best. Yeah. Have a great weekend. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye-bye.